Herr Dr. Ostrich, how very un-German of us to be five minutes late. Yeah, that's It's terrible. a pleasure, pleasure to have you. Uh, Sebastian is not only a good friend of mine, he's also assistant professor of philosophy in Stuttgart. And um, I have two of your books here. Wow. One on Hegel and the other one, let's play our game over on ethics uh, of computer games or video games. These are unfortunately only available in Germany, but what won't be available only in Germany is your course on Oswald Spengler's Der Untergang des Abendlandes, The Decline of the West, or The Going Down, as Heidegger maybe might say, of, <laughs> of the land of the evening, the land of the evening that must find its destino place in world history. I would like to begin Uh, you can say a bit more about yourself also, but I'd like to begin with the quote that ends Spengler's work, which is um, Du und Vater volentem nolentem traunt by Seneca, which of course everyone must understand. I won't uh, yes. to translate it. Uh, no, you, fate, no, you don't. No, you don't. Well, I mean, you never know. Who's listening to. Uh, <laughs> fate leads the willing and it drags along the unwilling. So, Let's see if some of you are the willing ones <laughs> who are able and capable to fulfill the destiny of Faustian man. So maybe also I'll say this and then I'll be quiet for the rest of the evening. You are the one to talk about this. <laughs> um, Faust II, the second Faust, the Faust that no one ever reads, yes. good Faust that is, not uh, Marlowe's, um, ends, of course, as a terrifying tragedy when Faust does completely cut himself off from the past after attempting to resurrect or retrieve something from the past and also begins to destroy the world almost entirely uh, through uh, machine technology. So you might disagree with this, but we'll see. The floor is yours, Sebastian. And well, by the way, if you have any questions for Sebastian on Spengler, etc., just uh, let us know in the chat. Yes, please let us know. So, hi everyone. Thanks, Johannes, for the kind introduction and um, for um, well inviting me to give this uh, course uh, with Halkion. I'm really excited about this because, well, Spengler needs to be read. And he isn't being read. Everyone's heard about Spengler, talked about, and everyone talks about Spengler. But my impression is that no one really has read him or tried to understand him, especially in academia. I don't know exactly how it is in in the U.S. or in Britain. Maybe you can say something about this, Johannes. But in Germany, Spengler is rarely, or maybe almost never, taught. Uh, at university, um, because he's um, well, uh, he's somehow somehow and um, become this 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 uh, this bad guy, and uh, people tend to like make snarky remarks about him or laugh it off. Um, but they actually, uh, it seems to me, they have no clue what they're actually laughing at. Um, so um, it's it's a kind of um, well. Uh, well, idiotic, uh, really, tendency of our days to uh, exclude uh, really a genius like Spengler um, from the curriculum. And uh, that's why I'm so happy that we finally get a chance uh, to uh, to talk about him and to, to, to read him. Yes, so quite a few people over the years have asked me to offer a course on, on Spengler. And I was thinking about doing it myself, and uh, but then out of the blue, you suggested it without me uh, mentioning anything to you. This was in February, so here we are. Without any academic red tape, you can actually um, uh, teach the course. By the way, just um, what I do know, as I am not aware of anything that's going on in Germany, I don't think much is going on anymore there. Um, <laughs> S certainly in the UK, you wouldn't even, of course, ever hear the word the West or the Occident or Spengler's name. 
uh, certainly not the word the Occident, uh, which is strange also. But um, in Italy, though, I have to say, in Italy, they uh -huh. do read uh, oh, people yeah. like Arnold Galen, Galen, no? yes, Jung, yeah, the Younger Brothers, Spengler, uh, and I do think that if from anywhere, it will be again once more Italy, which <laughs> we'll see a rebirth. <laughs> A rebirth might happen because they just read these texts. Um, that's very unash interesting. Unashamedly, and uh, that that's let's just also say they they do give talks on certain issues that you couldn't give a talk on in certain countries. Yes, you, you that's mentioned all I'll so say. you you yeah I you just, mentioned something mention to this about me about a certain fellow named Heidegger, but you, we don't have to go. Uh, we into don't have this, to go but, into this. But yeah, so, there is a certain um, what, what, what I think you is what are you saying? What you are saying is very important. I think that. Um, that they're reading that you, you said that the Italians are reading uh, Spengler and all these other people you mentioned unashamedly and that's so important because well maybe you could teach a course about Spengler but then you would have to like have five lessons at the beginning that tell you why he's really really evil and apologize. you know you, you have to pre-apologize pre and well now actually you have to do this with Kant as well uh, <laughs> in many <laughs> German universities I'm not kidding uh, but um, but with Spengler, it's, it would be even worse. So that's why, yeah, you have to, you can't read philosophy, any good philosophy, without having to apologize for it first. That's well, just, I think uh, you have to stupid. apologize for it because what they really are apologizing for, for the most part, is that they don't not, you know, they're not understanding what they're reading. That's it. That's it. Uh, and um, you know, it's easier to bash someone rather than trying to understand what they're saying. <laughs> So may maybe two things, be like because it might yeah. sound like we're we're really really Spenglerians, uh, if that's actually a word, or or that I am. And so I must say that I'm actually not a real like follower of Spengler in the yeah. in a narrow sense of the word word. Um, but I think uh, he's he has some really genuine insights, even though I I have many points of critique, but. Uh, uh, what is important, I think, that he is he has he's really important in two uh, ways. Um, mainly, first of all, in in really understanding the philosophy, what philosophy, philosophy of history actually is or can be, because people are not talking about philosophy of history at all anymore. But in the background, there is always a philosophy of history lurking in the way people think. You know, because people, how do people think? Well, usually in, in certain progressive terms and linear terms, like, well, yeah. things are getting better. And obviously, well, it's, well, we can't go back in time. And well, now, obviously, everything's better than 200 years ago. And well, of course, we wouldn't want to live di di there or then. And, and these, these ideas are just so, so utterly naive and stupid to imagine that, well, the entire history has just led up to this great moment in which now we live and and this type of it's naive... also a euro yeah. by the way just sorry this is it's a eurocentric universe exactly and the funny exactly. thing is that spengler and heidegger by the way are the exact opposite so the so-called progressives are eurocentric universalists who want to homogenize the world and rid the world and every civilization has used this term from its own destiny. Exactly. And Spengler and, wants the exact opposite. Exactly. And even when when leftists, let's call them that, bulky leftists or whatever, just stupid people, when they use terms like, well, Eurocentrism, what they're actually doing is like having a certain type of like universalism going along with that, namely, uh, well, applying the standard of a certain critique to everyone and forgetting that Eurocentrism is itself Eurocentric in a certain sense. But Spengler is always ref very aware of what he's saying and his own paradoxes. There are many paradoxes in, in Spengler's thought, but he's aware of them. And so it's not that simple to just point out that, oh, he's a relativist and so relativism is self-refuting. No, no, no. It's not that easy with Spengler. So that's the first point for me why we have to, you, we really have to read more Spengler. Uh, is to understand what philosophy history is, is uh, can be, and and to to get rid of certain errors in our thinking about about uh, about about history. And the other point is really uh, to understand. It's important to read Spengler to understand our own times. And I think we're still living in the same 
in the same rough well, period as beginning, yeah. as uh, as Spengler was living. We are and, now um, really moving into the civilization phase that he foresees. that's it. that's it that's it. And civilization for Spengler is well um, the that uh, period in in the life of a culture in which his culture becomes somehow well rigid and solidified and very technical as well and um and uh ideas of quantifiability and so on are are dominant and and certain well uh, well the spiritual creativity of a culture is 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 declining and i'm sorry but you really have to to shut both your eyes and your ears and everything else uh, to not realize that many of the things that uh, uh most of the things that spengler was diagnosing about his own time are correct diagnosis of our own time because it's the same time uh, we're living in and and this by the way has nothing to do with like pessimism of a, any you know th th that's not a valid counterpoint to spengler to say it's pessimism it's um it depends on how you look at things it's and that's why it's so 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 great that you quoted uh um this this uh, seneca. saying by Se by seneca um well it really depends on how you look at things you know you cannot Uh, you cannot forge your own way. Um, you cannot even think about a future if you don't realize uh, your own fate. And and this is true um, even if you don't subscribe to any sort of like strong determinism. Um, which, by the way, I'm not even sure that 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 we can attribute in any meaningful way uh, to Spengler. So all these things will be. Of course, well, the topic of our of our course, and I'm yeah. really happy that so many uh, people are already are already commenting and questions are coming up. So, uh, Johannes, you, you just we'll, we'll um, get to them and we'll we'll and, get to them later. Okay, so we'll yeah. we'll try to, to keep, answer keep as, the as questions many. coming. Uh, we'll get to them towards the end. We'll be here until about 8 p.m. my time, which is another half hour. Right. And in the meantime. Uh, do download the syllabus, which you can yes. find. Uh, there's a link in the uh, the live chat, but also in the description of the video. Yeah. It takes you here. Give us your name, give us your email, and then uh, agree and wait a couple of seconds or so until the Google Drive link opens up so you can actually download the syllabus, which gives you an idea of what we're going to read and discuss Uh, at the course. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that too. Um, it's obviously a very long book. So what sections will we focus on? Um, we'll, I think we're meeting 10 times for that one, right? That's right. We're seminars. meeting, we're meeting uh, 10 seminars. So if you want, I can I can just go through um, yeah. roughly through, through uh, what our plan is so far. Yeah. So, um, well, the, the book has, has two parts. I have like a German edition here. Where you can uh, see uh, actually both parts, and it's uh, quite thick. So you have what is it like, thousand two hundred pages, yeah. um, and uh, in the English translation, we'll of course be reading uh, the English uh, translation. Um, but um, I will, um, well, try to give uh, hints and some explanations about certain German terms as well, because. Uh, even though the translation is, is good, uh, as always with translations, especially with German philosophers, there is much that uh, gets lost in translation. So uh, luckily, uh, I'm a native German speaker, so um, I'll be able to, you know, just just talk about certain differences in translation or things get lost. Well, but there is a, like a two-volume translation of the decline of the West. It is by Arctus Media. It's a uh, Unfortunately, the second part is um, out of print right now, or out of stock at least. So maybe it's coming back. But there's another um, editor that has both parts, and I think both volumes. Um, I don't remember the editor's name right now, but um, we'll we'll send out emails or we'll oh, put yeah. it on this on the syllabus, so so people will know which books to buy if uh if they join uh the course so we so this is a two volume work by spengler the first volume focuses on well really 
the basic idea of of his morphology of 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 world history um so actually the possibility of conceiving world history in in such a way uh, as cultures and and life that have certain life cycles uh that they go through um and with certain well central ideas uh, uh to them and then certain well analogies or parallelisms between different world historical cultures and the second part of the book focuses well on on questions and topics that concern really the understanding of our of our own age and well we, we cannot read the entire text it would it would have it would be like a uh, a 30 session course if we wanted to do that that's just just way too long but we'll try to read um um well large parts of it so we'll have a which is very um a very important part is really the introduction because it's a lengthy introduction it gets across the idea the main idea of of his um way to conceive of, of world history or philosophy of world history and we'll have our first two sessions just about the introduction so that's roughly 60 pages to read and we'll have two sessions for that and uh you see we we can if you if we read 100 pages per session that's i think it's too much because we want to be able to do also some closed reading um we cannot go through the entire text in closed reading but some passages really have to be read in detail to fully appreciate the style of writing and style of thinking and the, the nuances and complexities of, of Spengler's uh, writing and I'm, I'm not a fan of just glossing over things um, but then of course the secret is not to get lost in the weeds but you know to always keep the big picture in mind so the first two sessions will be up about the introduction and then we'll uh, tackle a, a couple of like central um ideas that are developed in the first volume for example the idea of destiny um and, and which stands in certain sense in contrast to the principle of of causality so destiny and causality are not uh, necessarily the same here we'll talk about um we'll have a session about symbolism and mm. the symbolism of weltanschauungen of well, as of a world picture. Well, I don't know if that's a great translation, but then again, I would know a better one. But Weltanschauung is just just a great, great German expression. Um, and then um, in the second, so in the in the second part of our course, we'll 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 go to the second volume of Spengler's work, and we'll talk, uh, for example, about um, a chapter which is called the Soul, and yeah the soul of the city and which is one of my favorite parts of the book where uh well spengler explores um uh, the idea of what it means to to be uh living in a city what uh, what it, how cities and civilizations hang together and also well the contrast between city folk if you so on and 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 and, ru and rural uh, people living in rural uh, areas which is really a define a defining contrast um for our own time as well and one which i think might become even more uh, important mm. we'll we'll also talk about politics about parties about democracy and very important. Well, what does he say about democracy? Well, he thinks democracy is the greatest <laughs> political system. No, well, you have to come find out. But it's um, of course we we entirely yeah. distance ourselves from any such notion. Of course, that Spengler puts forward, and I uh, would just uh, like to stress how important democracy is in our democratic yes. values. So uh, I think what he says about democracy is that it's the preferred tool of money, well, which like rules that. the world. Yeah, this is uh, this is um, uh, exactly the last session will be about, or the uh, the one before the last session, the, our ninth yeah. session will be about um, the form world of economic life. We we'll also talk right. about machinery and money, and well it's the question is if it's a coincidence that uh, the century of democracy is also the century of uh, capitalism and um, money 
and um, the machine or technics. You see no connection. Well, we'll we'll explore I said, crazy. Yeah, well, just whole wholeheartedly distance myself from anything. Here. Right. Um, by the way, here's a quote from from Springer. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. From from Springer on uh, causality, I translate now. Causality is in or inorganic, uh, inorganic frozen destiny in the forms of the understanding. Or you know, uh, so like my dad cast into the forms of the understanding. This, mm -hmm. could, this could almost come from from Hegel. Yes, I, 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 you know, especially when you think of how Hegel and what Hegel means by understanding by Verstand. Yes, because um, for Hegel, Verstand is maybe we can explain this real quick. Verstand, uh, understanding means not to understand just something, but it's a certain mode of intellectually grasping something, namely the way it, understanding some understanding something means for Hegel sorting it, like putting it in a certain like pre-established uh, in certain pre-established boxes, as it were. You know, analyzing, separating things in order to have them neatly put next to each other. Of course, by doing that, you you you, um, uh, you you cease to see the connection between things, mm. like a synthetic view, like an organic view, a living picture of how things hang together. Rather, you have this, and this is not that, and this is not that, and so on. And this exactly is, I think, what uh, Spengler is referring to, also yeah. with his language. Yeah, I mean, there's beautiful sentences in Spengler, for example. Here. Wonderful. Uh, he yeah. sees he sees recurring symbols, and here's a quote of a world of uh, mysterious interconnections between the cultures. Um, that's from quite early on, and also just very briefly, then I let you get back to it. Uh, Heidegger painfully tries to find a thinking that is non-causal. He tries to go back to the Greek term "idea." which is then later translated by the scholastics as cause, which gets even further reduced by the likes of Francis Bacon to just the efficient cause, um, which is our time. So uh, idea as indebtedness, uh, interwovenness, dependence, re relationality, etc. So he does try to unearth uh, something there also. Um, okay, so we've s now heard the synopsis of the course i think we're hard to synop ex with one exception the last session Sorry. will be yeah. um a session of final uh discussions and and also presentations so everyone is uh um invited to uh to present something uh, of their own their thoughts um comments or or critiques or whatever they have whatever they have might have and then yeah uh, we'll use the last session to to discuss uh, those things and of course there will be discussions in, in every session but uh, it's a session for, for for your presentations really yeah so and if you want to have an overview over what uh, sebastian just said what we're going to discuss where and when then you should go to our website which is linked in the description of this video and download the syllabus all outlined there what we're going to read so actually if you thinking about taking the course we actually so we're beginning saturday 7th of october we always meet we'll we'll meet from 6 to 8 p.m uk time which is 7 to 9 p.m european time and um i think what is it like 1 to 3 p.m eastern standard time in america saturdays 10 saturdays uh, i think there's one break somewhere in between because you're you'll be in rome um so it's over 11 uh, weeks yes beginning in exactly one and a, no two and a half months now yes. and october so 7th download... no. go on yeah october 7th until S december 16th and yeah you should definitely go download the syllabus um and uh right below the picture so, of uh, spengler it's a shame that you put it down because i love this picture of, of spengler uh where he looks like us like a, a a british uh a football hooligan uh dressed in a suit um but there are other there he always looks somehow cool uh spengler um uh, but just a side note um so yeah sign up and um the the syllabus is well is not set in stone so if it turns out that 
we as a course are interested in certain things that are not in a syllabus or, or are different in other things, whatever, we shall proceed organically just as Spengler would have wanted, not by the means well, of the Verstand, um, but we'll proceed organically so we'll so we can yeah, always what, what adjust. About, yeah. What what about the learning outcomes though, mate? I mean that, that really messes everything up, doesn't it? Oh yeah, yeah of you course. Know, when you because <laughs> we have certain learning outcomes and you know we need to produce uh, a certain output here. That's that's okay, true. Okay, that was true. a bad you... joke. Um <laughs> well, go on. No, no, I, I was about to continue the joke, but it's not worth it. <laughs> So download the syllabus, obviously, when you do, we have your email address, so we will be contacting you in time, which will be sometime early September to let you know when enrollment is actually open. So here is a question by the Duke. Was Spengler better off without being stifled by academia? Well, it's a very, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, was he better off? Well, let's say academia was worth worse off by not taking him seriously. Um, and well, actually, they took him quite seriously because um, uh, the reactions at first were were there, and they didn't ignore him. They were like really ferocious um, for the most part. Um, why? I think because most people somehow understood especially academics and historians, that what they saw here far surpassed anything that they could have come up with on their own tiny little field. Um, the, er the erudition of this, of, of this man to me is unfathomable. Yes, yes. It's, it's, I, I have no idea how anyone ever could have written anything like this. Yes, In the time, yes. mind you, um, where all, the, all he had access to was a library. Yeah, amazing, absolutely mind blowing. And so, what many critics did, um, especially historians in the beginning, they focused on uh, like small historical questions or examples, and they were like, "Well, this is not, you know, this year is not correct or whatever." Like really minor details that you know could be corrected and without any, you know, without having to, any, any impact on any consequences <laughs> on the actual point so it was like really but, but uh, isn't that the whole purpose of academia exactly to be that is be, being consequential so, to just and this this is how this is why I'm, I'm mentioning it to 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 answer um uh the question um i think if they would have somehow like sucked uh spengler into academics they would have killed and accepted him as one you know, you know, a true academic or whatever, a true philosopher, they would have killed, they would have killed him exactly through this, uh, I don't know, um, I could say it, well, this, 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 this really tight grasp where you choke the life out of a living system until there's nothing really left, uh, only like detail, minor detail questions that are really of no import uh, whatsoever. So I think, yes, yes, in, in the long run, uh, it will have been great for Spengler. Okay, so here, did you read it in German? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I, I read it uh, now twice uh, in German and, well, in English now in preparation for the course. I, or I, I, I read it uh, a third, for a third time. And so... Um, and it's really interesting to read it in in English after having read it in German because sometimes you're really surprised by like, have I read this? I haven't even read, never read this before. And then you realize, oh yes, it is, but it sounds so different reading it in translation. So, uh, but that's an that's actually a a um, really um, well, it's an enlightening experience. The same for for Hegel and even Heidegger, I would say, when you're native yeah. German and then you read translations, you might be upset about bad translation whatever but still even the bad translation helps you to revalue um and you know rethink again the depth of 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 the meaning of certain german expressions and words and and, and phrases and so on okay um how did you come across spengler how did you come across spengler um well a good friend of mine 
um, was also a philosopher, but uh, was left academia, um, unfortunately. Well, again, not unfortunately. Unfortunately for academia, but fortunately for him, he left academia. Um, he he um, uh, he was uh, always very keen uh, on Spengler, and then well, he kind of just told me that I really have to read this because um, it's just a one of those philosophers that that are so unique. You can even if even if you end up disagreeing with pretty much everything what they have to say, it's still an enriching. Uh, experience to have read them. So really, as a philosopher, I think you must reach Bangla, even if in the end you decide that that he was wrong. So just by personal coincidence. Is he a determinist or not? I feel he's a determinist or not. Well, it depends on what you mean by determinism. So um, the, the way I think people think of, of this term determinism is that, well, he's a determinist and therefore there is no way in which human beings or individuals are free because somehow mechanistically we are determined. But we have already heard from, from the, the quote that Johannes read that the, the main notion of this, of our modern deterministic worldview is causality. Yeah. And obviously Spengler is not... Uh, not someone who who holds this principle of causality as something central to his own philosophy. So already in this sense, he's not a determinist. And what yeah. what what is construed as deterministic is basically the idea that cultures that there are such things as cultures that are living entities, and as as living entities, they have life cycles, typical life cycles they go through. Well, actually. It's, it seems to me to be absurd to, to from this to draw the conclusion that he's a determinist because, well, it's a triviality that human individuals have life cycles. And I'm not aware that the fact that I was a child once, I became older and I will, if God wills, once will be an old man and then die, that this fact somehow undermines uh, any meaningful sense of free will during this life cycle. Um, but just the main fact that I cannot be another human being, that I cannot live in another time, does that make me unfree? Well, if you, you don't sure? think so... Well, well if you, um, that's, if, that, that to me sounds uh, oppressed. That sounds very oppressive to me. That <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that I cannot be another human being. Well, well I that's... Think that's uh, trend, trends, I think trans-temporalism is the next big thing. Like I My, literally live in the Middle Ages, and oh, that would be awesome. So I'd be no, trans I do. <laughs> <laughs> I I'd, I'd, I'd like to be a Roman though. You know. Roman, all right. Yeah. So I think twelve fifty, twelve fifty for me would be. Um, so someone said to oh, me yeah, I, recently, "You want to? Do you, 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 you want to go back to the fifties? Do you want to go back to the fifties? And the right answer just came to me later: the twelve fifties. Yes. <laughs> By the way, here's a quote from Spengler. Die Zeit ist das Tragische. Time is the tragical element. Because it is irreversible. By the way, it would be a, a notion of the understanding, of course, to try and pigeonhole Spengler as, let's say, a pessimist or exactly. a determinist. So we need to get rid of the understanding. Again, uh, Susan has done, uh, I think, I, I don't remember, I'm pretty sure it was one Hegel course at least. So um, she, she, Susan is aware of Hegel, so that doesn't help you. Um, here's a comment from Dawson, which I think goes in the same direction as when you were just going. Should I read it? Spengler claims that he views yeah. cultures as organisms, and by this he means that Goethe's morphological method must be used as opposed to Darwinism. Perhaps this is how he avoids determinism. By the way, is that Dawson is uh, one of the one of the gentlemen who's been asking for. Uh, of course, on Spengler. So, all right. So, I hope uh, Dawson that you will be joining the course. Um, this, uh, I think, you're totally correct with your your assessment. This is one way in which we already can tell that uh, Spengler is not a determinist in, well, at least not in according to common parlance today. If we talk about determinism, um, and uh, at least, uh, and I, th so I think that the the, the Goethean uh, aspect of Spengler's philosophy is very, yeah. very, very important. 
you already talked a little bit about the the Faustian soul or the Faustian man, Johannes. Um, yeah. But he himself admires uh, Goethe. Spengler admires Goethe, but he not not only admires him, but he takes him as his well methodological role model. And yeah. but um, well, Goethe's methodology is is not is is really. Um, a really complex uh, one, one that is not down to, well, step one, step two, step three. Well, because why? Because it, it requires uh, actually imagination uh, and creativity of a certain part and some mm. sort of like intellectual grasping of, um, of analogical structures, uh, things that you cannot really compute. Yeah. And, and and the whole fact that things are to be you can think but, things methodolog methodically must, without being able to compute them. That's we must compute absolutely everything. <laughs> well, this is one German scholar so, who does not think so. He was wrong. <laughs> um, by the way, so here just maybe two thoughts on on when I read. Spengler, it gave me a, a deep sense of who we are, of who I am, that I had not come across before, really. So that is something that it might be able to do because we, I am German and I'm European and I'm off the Occident in this particular time. There's just no way around it. And if you'd like to understand who you are, then this text is really crucial. And um, it also made me appreciate Goethe in a completely different light than I had ever before. I'm obviously greatly fascinated by Goethe, just by, not, not because he's one of the greatest German poets, but also by how he lived, how extremely well-rounded an individual he was how capable he was because he was not just a poet he was also a politician extremely capable of um, organizing running uh, managing you could say the duchy of weimar and a theater director <laughs> uh, and also interested in in retrieving something of the past and getting in touch with it a wonderful book by the way to all you english readers out there two of them just very briefly Goethe, The Poet of the Age, by Nicholas Boyle. He spent his life, Professor Boyle, that is, um, writing these uh, philosophical literary uh, biographies, the two volumes of them. He was, by the way, he was the PhD supervisor of Stephen Holgate, you might want to know. I didn't know that. Yep, yeah. Uh, and uh, the other one is here with my Greek and ancient texts, which is, you know, the... the Goethe and the Greeks by another wonderful Englishman, Humphrey Trevelyan. It's always wonderful to read back against what it is that another uh, culture thinks of the Germans. Uh, as far as I know, Trevelyan was a diplomat. He was not a scholar. And he wrote this absolutely fantastic book. If you can get your hand, there are PDFs out. This is well worth your time or even trying to find a copy of it, Cambridge University press is the original imprint so uh, that's just my two cents very nice um so maybe just a, uh, oh you have a different question yeah. now i no no um, go on go on go, we can because go i saw i saw a question right now about rudolf steiner which i found really interesting we, we, we go we go um just chronologically I think. all right all right, so, all right, all right as right. i forget so here's max another max also has been asking for this course so um do you see a connection between spengler and T turkin Turkey, I'm not aware. Well, to be to be totally honest, if you're not aware, Johannes, I'm not aware. Okay. School us, idiots, on uh, on what you what are you hinting uh, at? Um, well, not just hinting, but uh, actually, well, Max so, will be in the course, so he will have a chance to ask you. That. All right. Also known as, and I know uh, the name of this fine gentleman. I won't. Uh -huh. um, uh, but uh, so also known as Arthur, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rudolf Steiner, but if so, do you have any thoughts on the resemblance between his portrayal of history and Spengler's? Well, Rudolf Steiner is a very interesting German 
figure. He's um, the founder. He's a well philosopher, spiritualist, mystic, uh, educator, and uh, best known in Germany for a certain type of school he founded with a certain very unique type of edu like type of education and method of education. It's called Waldorf Schule. I th think they're internationally uh, known, Waldorf, Waldorf schools. They're, they're called Ste Steiner schools in the UK. They're called Steiner schools in the UK. See, okay, I didn't know. Yeah, so, so by his name. And, and... So, so Rudolf Steiner was a not only an expert on German idealism, I think especially on, on Fichte, but he was an admirer of Goethe. Um Probably Goethe was his, his the most important uh, figure for him. So this is uh, an, uh, an obvious connection between the two. But as to your concrete question about Steiner's philosophy of history, I must admit that I am not aware um, about the specifics of his philosophy of history, but I only know about this connection um, between Steiner and Goethe and then Spengler and, and Goethe. Uh, but I, I would love to uh, hear more if you if you know more about that. Um, so thanks for that um, for that question. Yeah, also known as is currently in the spiritual cybernetics course. So also known as might also join us for this one. Oh, Why nice. Not? I'm I'm looking up Turchin. I I think so. If I think uh, uh, what was meant in the question before is Peter Turchin. Um, or Turchin, which he's, uh, he's a Russian-American scientist, and I'm reading off Wikipedia right now. And um, now that I read of him, I'm it, it seems to me that I've heard the name, but I have, unfortunately, no idea um, what, um, what his uh, thoughts are. So I'm sorry about that. Well, that's what the course is for. So when, you know, Max... Uh wants to write something on this or present and then um, great we can discuss this further because there will obviously be figures now who might be um working along similar lines continuing maybe the work that was begun so uh how would Schwingler explain the living reality of cultural syncretism or is that just pseudomorphous pseudomorphosis sorry for him well um Pseudomorphosis. Well, obviously, the idea of um, uh, cultures like as self-enclosed living entities does not mean that they're like epistemologically totally self-enclosed because otherwise we couldn't even know about different cultures. So there's many things like cultures take from other cultures, but they always do so in a modified sense. So that's the whole point that the, and this is even true, and th this is where it gets paradoxical, uh, even for Spengler, uh, and this one makes it most intriguing probably, is that even Spengler's own view, which is a certain kind of syncretism since it's, well, it encompasses the entire course of history. Well, this view itself is one which is only, well, true, now from our vantage point of history so yeah. we have to we have to ha always have the self-reflective move with spengler um which does not preclude uh the grasp on other cultures but but as soon as we like as soon as a culture touches or reaches another one it it modifies it it makes a difference well this is also pretty much a hegelian thought by the way that there is in this sense there is no uh, immediate uh, history uh, or anything immediate in history for us because everything is modified by the way we we look at it so maybe this mm -hmm. is the the, the way to to answer the question or the problem a pseudomor a pseudomor but if, if you're interested i mean one of one of the greatest texts never read is by richard wagner richard wagner <laughs> 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 Richard Wagner, nice. You may, have, you, may have, you may have heard of Richard Wagner. He was like a great composer. Uh, Richard Wagner, songwriter. Assist, yeah, <laughs> he was the first heavy metal song. Like, he, he literally invented cinema and heavy metal on his own. And he was also a great philosopher. 
he wrote a text which is also verboten, which is Was ist Deutsch? What is German? Uh, and unlike his um, friend, then later enemy, uh, Nietzsche, he does not just claim that oh, I'm a Polish nobleman and all that matters is Europe because Europe is nothing without its nations and its different cultures and languages. In what is German, though... I distance myself from this. I'm not saying anything. So um, what what uh, Wagner there says is that with foreshadowing Spengler and not using quite that terminology, but he does say that the, the Germans suffer from from a pseudomorphosis with, within themselves. They, oh, yeah. they, they fail to recognize who they are. Uh, and that it's also peculiarly German of having of having to leave. He, he mentions explicitly Handel, who went to who, who, who breathes out, he says, uh, his Baroque music in England. And it is Mozart who then completes or contributes significantly to Italian music. Um, but so th those are the moments where they the, the Germans or get to something of their essence or their core and an essence not as transtemporal or anything um simply simplistically essentialistic uh but it's something that also is is becoming and is in becoming so he does foreshadow that a little bit so it doesn't even need to syncretism or elements coming in from outside it can just also be internal you misunderstand who you are and what your destiny is yes and yes. that can contribute that actually adds to the misery of the world yeah, yeah. But by the way, this reminds me of something I I, I think um, heard about Steiner, or actually even read uh, in one of Steiner's writings, um, referring back to the other question before, um, yeah. that what is so typical about about the German uh, soul, if you will, is um, the lack of any specific determination. So to will as like the the possibility to be any soul, and um, and this would be somehow you know uh, this 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 strange um, this would also somehow well connect to what you've been uh, saying, Johannes, about a certain inherent misunderstanding about ourselves, uh, always wanting to be not ourselves but someone someone else, and this is but this is actually who the who what the German soul. Uh, is I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure that I'm getting right, but I think I think I'm remembering correctly. So, again, maybe we have to talk about Steiner more. Um, here's a brief question I can respond to. Would you have a cause on Goethe? Yes, there is one. So I'm working on one and a half, been for the better part of last year. It's just always an issue of time. I don't want to offer too many courses in a year. Next year, there will be quite a few courses on Greek philosophy. So I don't know if Goethe fits in. Maybe in the summer, it would be a short one. It will focus uh, on, on Faust um, and his writings on, uh, uh, on, on Prometheism and on nature. So um, that's so the, the plan is there. It's all basically wow. written out. It's just it just need it's just not yet the right time. But you know. Um, also, because this year I wanted to have as many good new people join, like Ryan Hecker and uh, Sebastian Ostrich, to teach their courses. So I'm, I've stepped back. And uh, Sean McFadden has also done a great course on the philosophy of the machine. Um, Sebastian taught a course earlier this year in German on Hegel. And um, so next year, I don't know, maybe there will be one on Goethe. It might be a shorter one. Uh, but it will be one that introduces us to everything. By the way, Sebastian, if you could tell us, you mentioned analogical structures. Where, where in, in Goethe? Um, do you remember? Oh, morphological structures. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. Did I mishear you? Not, yeah, not mo analogical. Mo morphological. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I mean the the method of of analogy some is is one of or at least according to Spengler, the method of morphology uh, morphology is one of analogy as well where you see hmm. um well you, you you see the similarity uh similarities between things and that's how you how you uh, actually um and then through imagining certain variations so it's very phenomenological in a certain sense already now that i'm explaining it yeah, i'm already reminded of of uh well many uh, strands of phenomenology but this is uh, i think inherent already in in, in goethe
So that's what I was talking about. Uh, Harris, uh, thank you very much for wow. the very fine contribution. Harris continues to be the first and only contributor uh, <laughs> with the super chat. This is the, the and I can count them on one hand still, obviously, because uh, thank you so much, Harris. Harris was in the uh, philosophy of the machine course. He also gave a talk, so you can listen to that. You can follow his work on his YouTube channel, which is Upcycle Club. That's All right. his, um, one of his businesses. All right. And I'll, 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 and, um, I'll give him a sub immediately just for that. We can, be, we can be bought. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's the time of money after all. Du kun Vater volenten volenten brauchen. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a talk by him also in the Philosophy of the Machine Pro seminar. So thank you again very much, Harris. So if you have more questions, let us know now because um, we are about to leave. We're already here longer. But you don't forget to download the syllabus. Was Spengler disgusted by the Weimar period? Well, short answer, yes. Yes. I think it's very clear. Uh, he, he was um, he was a a, a, a conservative, uh, but uh, not a national socialist. Um, that's no. probably the shortest uh, shortest answer to that question. That's all that needs to be said. Could you give your opinion on what Spengler meant when he said optimism is cowardice? Well, optimism in the sense of not wanting to see what is inevitable in front of you there yeah. yeah. in front of you there if you mean mm. that by optimism well that's just a form of not wanting to see what lies ahead of you and which may be uh, very uncomfortable and unsettling and if you d decide not to see that because you decide not that you don't want to be um somehow shaken or whatever then this is this is this is cowardice um this does not mean that you should that you should be like somehow whiny and pessimistic no that's not spengler at all spengler is very well to put it with trump high energy in that sense that he he's obviously always thinking about what are we to do now but what are we to do now given certain uh, inescapable realities that we have to face. And yeah. we have to act. Obviously, we have to act. But the question is, do we act in accordance with reality? Or do we deny reality and just no. say, well, everything will be all right? That's cowardice. And that's, I think, false optimism, if you want to uh, qualify that the kind of optimism he's talking about there. Question from Harris. How did Spengler's polymathy influence his organic wow. theory of history? Harris, I hope you can come to the course. Oh well, yeah, you have to come to the course. Well, that is that is um that is a question which is uh too large to be answered, uh, uh probably on in such a, in a short fashion. Well, um I think his organic theory is not even possible without him being a, the polymath he is because um, he's not talking about certain aspect of, of, of a culture, but he's really talking about everything in its organic connection. And so he's talking about science. He's talking about arts. He's talking about philosophy, about politics, about, um, well, whatever you, morals, ethics, pretty much everything, and he's talking about everything in a in a very historical, in its in its unique historical setting and sense. So that Johannes already said it, it's unfathomable how he uh, how he got to know the things he knew and to make the connections he he made. So um, that's. Uh, I think uh, those those two things are are very connected, and and this is why it's so difficult to engage with Spengler because no one today actually has that kind of knowledge. I think that Spengler had. No, obviously not. I mean, this is also an issue. Of, say the obvious, and most of you know much of Heidegger scholarship 
is that um, you have people who neither are capable of the German language, nor the Latin, nor the Greek. The Greek plus, but, yeah. you know. Okay, how does Spengler, I think that's a final question, how does Spengler deal with his idea of civilization as the dying of culture when it comes to long-lived, profoundly historically rich ones such as India and China? Could a culture die twice? Well, dying, well, I think it can, it can live. I think already like being in a state of civilization is having died in a certain sense. And it's, and uh, if you pull up, if you prolong the state of, of civilization, I mean, it's like a zombie-like state, if you will. So you can, and, and you can go on for a very long time as a zombie. And um, so the question is, um, well, obviously about our own times, if we are dying or already zombies, maybe this is, um, this is the question. So I wouldn't say dying twice, but I think um, uh, being undead, maybe that's it. Yeah, so, you know, who, who, ask yourself this without naming any names of any particular country or let's say culture or civilization. Ask yourself this, who really is going their own path? Or is not almost everyone, especially maybe those two, let's just say, re, let's just say zones, economic zones, areas, are they not competing? in the same markets is not what they are really now doing it up leveling up and completely industrializing at a speed that was hitherto unseen are they not completely in some way losing themselves in uh, and have precisely not found their destiny one of the darkest things that heidegger once points out in a conversation to someone from Japan is that in the moment that Europe begins to forget itself, the world is being colonized by European thought forms. So if you're competing on the world stage in terms of economic competition or competitiveness, in terms of genetic, uh, genetic modification of human DNA or animal DNA or plant DNA, if you're competing on the level of AI and similar things and computation, then you are playing not your own game or you're not for forging towards your own destiny. You are playing into a framework that is not yours. And so, yeah, I, that's what, that would be my response. So it is dead. And they're walking towards the same cliff that we are. There was a very grim, but very uncowardly way of putting things, Johannes. <laughs> I haven't even begun yet. So I think we've, you know, we've taken enough of Sebastian's time. I think there's a couple more questions, but uh, he's responded to all of them bravely and greatly. So thank you very much for your time, Sebastian, and thanks to everyone Thank you. Uh, in attendance. So please download the syllabus and we will notify you about enrollment early on before we do on YouTube. If you do uh, let us now um, know that you'd like to participate, we'll let you know about uh, tuition fees, etc., as well, so that we can keep the lights on and this particular machine going. Um, as we're moving towards our own abyss, who knows? So again, thanks very much, Sebastian. Closing remarks. Thank you, Johannes. Thanks for thanks everyone for their amazing questions, really insightful questions, and I'm makes me just more thrilled for the upcoming course. And I hope uh, I, I see you guys uh, there. And uh, I, well, take care until then. We shall retire. Good night.